Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I need to introduce Jan Schlover since he's very well known, but uh, I thank him that he accepted our invitation and he will talk about the Queensland Sun Dunes. introduce myself a bit, my name is and fortunately enough, I was born more than half a century ago already, just around the corner here in Apollinarsen, um, it was a special pleasure for me to be able uh, to talk to you exactly from here. Perhaps you know this gentleman, it's Vladimir uh, Kreina, the man who described Pingricula Bohemica, a special uh, Pingricula butterwort species that is considered endemic uh, to the Czech Republic. There are a few different taxonomic views around this taxon, um, but this is the man who started at least um, the discussion about that. My favorite uh, species is uh, the uh, unusual plant. And uh, what I would like to try is to beg you that you can find the unusual in places where you would not necessarily expect it. Um, especially, I'm not going to talk about very many species except for some places where this talk is going to be very general. Actually, I'm focusing on only three species from a fairly limited geographic range. So all of you who expect anything else but creams and sand, you would probably be bored by my talk today. But perhaps not, because there's other and more aspects to these plants that may be obvious. Um, at first sight. So let's just see. The outline of my talk will be first, I will give a short introduction into uh, the more chemical um, aspects of my talk today and to introduce the plants in general to you that are characterized by forming these special compounds. Then, unfortunately for those who don't like chemistry too much, I cannot avoid talking about biosynthesis, uh, the physiological processes by which these compounds are formed. Because that's also quite important for understanding the later chapters, because different species are usually characterized by different secondary metabolites. Uh, so even closely related species may be differentiated by looking at the compounds they contain alone. And especially in the genus Rosala, the sundews, there is a rather strict differentiation in the metabolite pattern that characterizes uh, different species. And I will give as an example uh, the section Prolifera, the Kings and Sandus of the genus Prosla. I will also uh, give a short overview of a few species that are known in this uh, particular section. And then I will discuss a few um, chemical characteristics of these species in more detail. And the last part of my talk will focus on an artificial hybrid that has been bred between two of these species in the Czech Republic. So my talk will have several aspects that are intimately linked with this particular place where I'm going to talk about these things. 
<clears throat> Let's see. So what do these three different plant groups have in common? Not very much from a morphological perspective. However, all three of these groups, walnuts, the ladworts, and the sinews, contain compounds called quinones. And in particular, all three of these groups have naphthoquinox. I will come to this shortly, what this actually is. They are characterized by compounds that are similar, not only in chemical structure, but also in their biochemical properties. Namely, the simplest of these naphthoquinones is the juclone. It's not already not a simple uh, naphthoquinone structure only, but it's also, in addition, characterized by this additional hydroxyl group that gives particular <coughs> features to these compounds. So they do not um, actually behave like simple quinones, but by virtue of this hydroxyl function, for instance, they can behave differently in terms of, for instance, coloration, in different environments um, that are differing in the uh, acidity because you can abstract this proton from the hydroxyl function that gives a different um, chemical behavior to the molecule. And very similar compounds are actually found in ladwords and sundews. Both of these genera um, contain several species uh, that form this structure called plumbagin. Plumbagin after plumbago, the name of the, uh, the Latin name of the Latin word. This is a jute structure characterized by an additional methyl group. Now in plumbagin, this methyl group is in the quinoid ring in the right half of this structure. Quinoid ring is characterized by these two uh, oxo functions. Um, and in addition to plumbagin, drosera, the sundews, also have several species that form another isomer of plumbagin. It's also Likewise, the juglone structure, so similar to the metabolite from the water, but in 7 methyl juglone or ramantaseone, the additional methyl group is found in the phenolic aromatic ring. So, in one of these structures, the methyl group is in the quinoid ring at position 2. And in the other isomer, the methyl group is in the non-quinoid, in the uh, <coughs> phenolic, um, in the aromatic ring, in position at position seven. This is a very particular metabolite because so far it has been found only in the genera Drosera in the Sandus, in the Pentes, and in Diosporus in the broad sense, um, so including several other closely uh, related uh, species to the Asperos. And as an odd occurrence also in one instance in the genus Uvaria. Um, I would suggest that this finding, however, should be reconfirmed. It's a fairly old paper, and I'm not sure um, whether this can really be Reproduced. I haven't investigated this just so far myself. So I can tell. Anyway, a very rare compound. Whereas plumbagin is a bit uh, more widespread. It's found in the whole order that contains both plumbago and Drosera. It's obviously found in Evanase that contains Diosporos. Many Diosporos species contain plumbagin as well. And also in a monocot 
family, the Irish uh, Aridase family. So it's more widespread than Ramantazone, which is more restricted in its distribution, but both of these isomers occur in Crossroad. In, however, uh, usually in different species. So how are these compounds formed? This, uh, in the beginning, it's a fairly simple story because um, all you need uh, to look at is this bond between two carbon atoms. The whole carbon skeleton of these quinones is formed from acetic acid or from acetate units. Um, and the biosynthesis runs through successive elongations of this carbon chain that is growing by condensation with mononyl CoA moieties. So in each round of change, along, uh, of chain elongation, two carbon atoms are added to the growing uh, carbon chain, and the whole procedure ends after six car uh, two carbon units are concatenated in this way. This process is very similar to the biosynthesis uh, of fatty acids. However, the difference between fatty acid synthesis and this polyketide synthesis is the growing carbon chain is not further reduced. Whereas in fatty acid synthesis, the rest of the unfatty chain is reduced to the hydrocarbon. In polyketide synthesis, these keto functions are retained in the growing chain. Now, polyketides are very reactive chemicals. They tend to form all sorts of intramolecular or additional intramolecular carbon-carbon uh, bonds. Um, and in order to prevent this, this polyketo chain remains associated with the synthetic enzyme. Only in this association it's possible to prevent further reactions of this um, polyketide. However, for a hexaketide, the chain is initially too short to form the ring structure that is required for the naphthoquinone formation. So in order to be able to fold this polyketide chain in a manner that would allow cyclization, the formation of the ring structure, the growing Polyketide chain is reduced at this one position. And this reduction allows this chain to be folded back upon itself, and then upon condensation between these carbon atoms and between these, the primary bicyclic structure is formed. So this is the first naphthalenoid ring structure produced from the initial polyketide, which is in turn produced from um, effectively six acetate units. Whereas the polyketide synthase has been isolated and sequenced from Plumbago, so we know roughly how this enzyme looks like. Almost nothing is known about this crucial step that is a prerequisite for cyclization. So actually it hasn't been possible to produce <coughs> this primary bicycle in vitro so far because it, nobody really knows where to get this enzyme from which reduces the polyketo chain at this specific position. 
unfortunately, this is not the only detail that is not known about this biosynthesis, however. This is the same structure as below, the primary bicycle, and in order to obtain um, the quinoid structure, this now needs to be modified further. Um, actually, it needs to be, uh, in effect, oxidized at one or the other position. This hypothetical structure is linked by mesomery to these two structures that are essentially equivalents of each other. It's the same molecule just turned around. Um, so you have the same uh, functions here and the same arrangement of the carbon units from the initial acetate molecule. So it's just the same molecule viewed from opposite sides. And now, and this is even more interesting in the matrix step, the additional oxygen atom is introduced into the ring, and this must be an enzymatic uh, reaction or an enzymatically catalyzed reaction because it is not only ritual specific, so the enzyme does not only select for the position um, of the methyl group in the initial bicycle, but it's also stereospecific. The main <coughs> compounds in either plants are with an R configuration at this newly introduced hydroxyl function. So it's a plant-specific process. It's not a spontaneous reaction. It cannot be a spontaneous reaction because the spontaneous reaction would yield the mixture of both orientations. Um, so this step is both regio and stereo specific and it's certainly an enzymatic step. However, unfortunately, we don't know closer to nothing about this enzyme, unfortunately, because it's this enzyme that yields specificity to the whole process and that is characteristic sometimes even for closely related species. Closely related species may produce opposite molecules, opposite um, after quinones. The other step may be a more or less spontaneous oxidation of these tetralones. These structures are called tetralones. Uh, that finally yields the ready quinone structures. And here you see the difference between the two, two uh, related molecules is actually created in this step here above. So this essentially, I want to tell you about the origin of these uh, molecules. Now how about distribution? This is a historical account on what was known about the distribution of the quinones in the genus Drosera in the sand use, more or less an outline of the whole um, phylogenetic tree um, of the sand use. Um, two aspects that are fairly interesting is that the pygmy sand use apparently uh, lack aftoquinones whatsoever. So far, nobody was successful in isolating any naphtoquinone from the pygmy cell use. However, more recently in Drosera banksii, that is uh, somewhat distantly related to the pygmies, um, Drosera banksii does contain uh, low amounts of naphtoquinones. But the pygmies themselves don't. Another aspect that is of some interest is that in the tubers species, one naphtoquinone species prevails, namely plumbergi. That's almost characteristic for the whole group. But there are a few outliers. 
Uh, interestingly, the most widespread species, Drosa feldhata, apparently contains both quinones in the same plant. <coughs> and in the Drosra stolonifera complex, there is actually a collection of closely related species, contains either one or the other quinone, depending on the subspecies or the uh, microspecies that you consider. And the Queensland sundews, they have all been investigated before. However, naftoquinones have been found only in two species, namely in Drosra prolifera plumbagin, and in Drosra adele, the opposite quinone was found. And that was something that I thought would be interesting and um, of some well value to investigate a, a little bit further. Um, for some reasons, and uh, a few I will show you. Now, first, what are the Queensland sundews in the sense of my talk today? The Queensland sundews are obviously sundews of which the distribution is limited to Queensland in northeastern Australia. And it's even more restricted. Um, they are restricted to the region around the town of Cairns, uh, just at the base or um, at the um, easternmost coastal region of northern uh, Queensland, the Cape York Peninsula. Cape York is here in the northernmost part of Queensland. Not further than Townsville which is the southernmost limit, and just um, a bit north of the Cairns with Lithera. There's no overlap in these ranges, and of the central species, Rosalind's Cassandra, only a very few localities are actually known all around the Mount Bartle near south of Cairns. Drosra Adele is the most widespread of these species, and Drosra Prolifera is the species that has been discovered and described as the latest of the three in the 20th century. The first was already in 1864, Rosso Adele, characterized by long, narrow leaves that are um, with an acute tip and um, they have almost no petioles um, and not very showy flowers actually. Um, I've been fortunate enough to observe this species um, in the wild in uh, 2016 from the ICPS conference in Cairns, uh, maybe a short field trip to this locality, you can see the very narrow leaves here. They are actually a, a bit narrower than in the drawing, putting the original description. So this is perhaps a bit idealized or from another uh, population. This is what you can expect in the field and you will also see this mostly in cultivation as well. Um, so the plants are usually very, very narrow leaves, always with an acute leaf tip, pointed leaves, and um, fairly small flowers. However, sometimes with interesting coloration, some maybe orange or dull red. A few are just plain green, so that's a bit variable. The second one, and in this drawing it's only the right half because the other one is the older, the Rosa there, um, also with rather broad leaves here in the drawing. Um, Rosa Kisandra, uh, with the most restricted range of, of these three species, has um, mainly broader and obtuse leaves. They are not so often really emergent, usually like in, 
and it's photographed or see this better in this picture, um, usually rounded, but some may be emerging to some degree, it, it does occur. So it's not entirely wrong. Also, not very showy flowers. Um, this is a plot from cultivation. Um, most notably, the leaves do also uh, lack a real stalk. They are a bit narrower in the basal part, but not really stalks. So there's no petiole. Here in, in juvenile specimens, you can sometimes see a very narrow leaf base. Uh, but usually in, in adult plants, there is no petiole. And the third has been described only in 1914. So all three of them were described in a span of 80 years in the late uh, 19 to, uh, 19th to early 20th century. And the third is a bit more different from the first two. It has a clear petiole and a ready form a lamina, and most notably, from the tip of the inflorescence, new rosettes are formed. So this is why this uh, plant is called prolifera, the proliferous sundew, because it forms stolons from its inflorescence. Fairly unusual, um, as I have introduced. For a fairly plain sundew species, it's quite an unusual uh, feature, actually. <coughs> so unusual that uh, the original author, White, created a new section, prolifera, for this species only. And only later is that it has been recognized that Drosophila and Schizandra are actually closely related to this uh, unusual uh, member. And, and they are so closely related that uh, they are now regarded to belong all into this one section. And they are obviously also very closely uh, located uh, to each other. All restricted. And this is how it look, usually looks like in cultivation. Um, I'm delighted to see that all three species are also offered um, for sale in the exhibition. So you can buy them if you are interested or become interested in these species on my talk. Um, they are all available in cultivation, which is good because they can easily be obtained for chemical investigation. And this is um, what I did. Um, so this is again the historical um, knowledge about the quinones in these three species. But a re-investigation showed that also Drosera schizandra contains a quinone, namely seven method jupilone or Ramantia Sloan. Um, which is interesting not only because um, it's a new finding for an already investigated species, it also confirms the perception that somehow these two species are more closely related to each other than this third one, which has a clear and is the material and this strange formation uh, stolons from the inflorescence. But it's also interesting for another aspect, which I uh, would like to highlight here. The Queensland species are restricted to Queensland, but it was a Czech a grower, namely Kamil Pasek from Ostrava, in the Czech Republic, who tried to create artificial hybrids between the species and Unbelievable as it is, he actually succeeded in obtaining um, one hybrid from the different combinations of the species. And uh, more interesting 
even as that uh, he was successful in crossing the two species that apparently are not the closest to each other because he succeeded in crossing process Cassandra, the, the central species, with the northern one. Um, although the two currents do not really share too many features, including the chemistry, they have opposite quinones. And all other uh, trials he has made, and they were quite numerous, and is still continuing trying, but uh, all others have failed. There's possibly one more reason for this uh, incompatibility in the chromosome count, because these two species that success successfully formed a hybrid do share the same chromosome number, whereas Drosera adele, which apparently is fairly close to Drosera schizandra, has a different chromosome number. So this is one of the possible reasons why it has so far not been possible um, to cross these two species, or to cross Trosera adele with any of the other two. Possible reason, because chromosome counts are not necessarily absolutely exclusive for, for compatibility. So he tries, he continues trying, perhaps we will see some more surprise, surprises in the future, but at present we will focus on the successful uh, hybridization. This is how, perhaps not um, ideally grown uh, plants of this hybrid look in cultivation. I can, for obvious reasons, not show you any pictures from the natural habitat that we consider is now. It's an artificial hybrid. But you can already see the petiole from Rosera um, prolifera is it's not actually a patio that is focused. You can see the very narrow leaf base here, much narrower than usually in Drosera schizandra. And also, it is proliferous. It does proliferate from some of the inflorescences. Sometimes the inflorescence does not develop entirely, and when the tip of the inflorescence just uh, with us, it will not form a rose, but some of these inflorescences actually do produce uh, stolons. So there are several features intermediate between the two parent species, which is a good thing because it more or less proves already by morphology that it is the hybrid and not just uh, a cell thing. But Remember that different genomes <coughs> are formed in the different parent species of this hybrid. So whereas Drosera cassandra forms from Antaceum, Drosera prolifera contains plumbagi. So how does the hybrid look like now? At least for chemists, this is a fairly thrilling question. Um, how to test this? And especially how to test this with a method as simple as possible. The answer is by thin layer chromatography. It's a fairly simple method in which you use a card um, that is laminated by an adsorbent that will allow capillary flow or capillary movement of a liquid up to the front of this card. And because different chemicals are dissolved differently or distributed differently between the moving liquid and the adsorbent surface, they will have different um, speeds of movement along the chromatography card. Um, and this is determined by the different chemical structure. So you can separate a mixture of compounds fairly easily by thin layer chromatography. 
in which you apply these mixtures to a starting line and then let the solvent separate the compounds along this chromatographic path and then you observe where these different compounds have migrated. Another aspect to these Renault structures is that they can be easily detected, especially in the UV light, because they have a characteristic absorbance. And in UV light, the TLC card looks like this. If you apply plumbagin or the extract from a species that contains plumbagin, like for instance, Drosrite intermedia, the intermediate sundew that is also native here in the Czech Republic, you obtain after chromatography a single spot for plumbagin at this position, which is clearly different from the position that. 7 methyl juclone or amantasyron will have after chromatography because it migrates slower from the same TLC cut. Now, the hybrid <coughs> Drosra, Rotolifolia, and Drosra intermedia contains both quinones of the opposite parent species. So, obviously, the inheritance of the uh, quinone fault. That means the inheritance of the enzyme with the mentioned stereospecificity and regiospecificity. This inheritance is additive or, um, as the phenotype is intermediate, is also termed co-dominant. So both terms dominate their quinone structure to the hybrid. And the same is true for the Queensland sundew hybrid. Whereas Drosa prolifera behaves like Drosa intermedia in containing only plumbagin, and Schizandra contains only Ramitaceon, seven method duplow. The, the artificial hybrid between these two species contains, uh, like in the European species, both twinodes. So this <coughs> confirms the quinone hybrid rule that says that hybrids of quinone heterogeneous parents contain the combined quinones of both. So the quinone patterns are additive, as you have seen in the tin layer chromatography. This obviously has been confirmed by more sophisticated techniques like uh, mass spectroscopy and the NMR, but uh, it's I think not really necessary to go into these details here. Um, so it has been confirmed that the two different structures are actually present in the hybrid plants. And that means in turn that the inheritance of this chemical feature is co-dominant. So not only the morphological in uh, inheritance is intermediate because the plant looks like a hybrid between the, the two parent species. This hybridity can also be confirmed by uh, the quinone pattern. So when we look or when we go back to the distribution of quinones in Drosera, we can see uh, that there are several species uh, that apparently contain both quinones and interestingly it's usually those species um, that either have an elevated chromosome count which also indicates a hybrid history in their uh, phylogeny or like in the, the case of Drosma indica um, it is the so far only known representative of its section, Drosera arachnopus, that contains both quinones. There is a number of related species, some of which have been described only uh, recently in the section arachnopus, 
Um, mainly this section is centered in or around Australia. And all of these recent segregates of Drosera Indica, not Drosera Indica itself, but these recent segregates are characterized by just a single twinner, either Plumbergi or Ramantaseum. Only the most widespread species Drosera Indica itself that ironically does not occur in Australia at all, so far, as far as we know. This one species contains both. Now, it's an open question uh, how this combination in this species was accomplished, because that's, there's no morphologically similar uh, species from which Trosra Indica could have inherited uh, the Ramantaceo. The Puma gene is fairly widespread in, in section Arachnobus, and there are several candidates for having contributed this one. But the other one is restricted to strictly Australian endemic species, and nobody really knows whether one of these may have anything in common with the phylogeny of the Trosra Indica. So, that's an open question to be resolved in the future. And I have already highlighted that, likewise, the fairly widespread Rosa Peltata, if you compare its range, its global range, to the individual ranges of the other tuberous Sandu species, it's the most widespread representative of this group, has also both quinones. And I have briefly already mentioned this situation in Rostolifera. Um, this would be another interesting field of further uh, research. Another example is, however, Drosera Regia. Drosera Regia has a position so basal in Drosera that by certain genetic comparisons, this was uh, based on the RBCL gene, it is even closer to Aldrovanda than to the rest of the genus. Obviously, it is not uh, representative of Aldrovanda, but representative of Trosra. But it is one of the basal most species in, the, in that genus. So it's not very likely that it was formed by hybridization from any other two Sandu species. It's um, probably the oldest surviving uh, ancient species in this genus, and it already has both quinones. So, perhaps an alternative theory as to its uh, phylogenetic origin is appropriate. Um, but I'm at a loss uh, formulating this hypothesis here now. Perhaps in the future we will see. Um, another interesting aspect is that. In a Pentaceae, uh, species containing both quinones are very, very frequent, much more frequent than in Drosera. And this also coincides with the notion that uh, many species in the Pentaceae may be of very recent hybridogenic origin. Um, this does not necessarily mean that it's always possible to formulate both parent species but they have many features, and in addition, um, they have the feature in common that um, they very easily form hybrids. There is apparently no barrier to hybridization within the whole genus. Um, it, it's fairly easy to obtain artificial hybrids from any uh, combination of species. Um, Another example is that of Diospyros in the Ebenase. Here we observe also a large number of species that contain both quinones. So apparently um, the feature that quinones are restricted to a single species and uh, one species usually contains only one of the two possible isomers does not apply to Diospyros. We have in the situation that both you know, are present in the same plant as far more than in the sand use. So that's more or less the, the global situation with um, the quinone distribution. So let's come to the following conclusions. 
All Drosula species investigated so far are more or less, I must say, invariant in their individual supremal mechanism. And that does mostly mean that uh, a sample species contains only one of the two possible isomers. I have noted uh, the exceptions, there yeah, are some. And of the majority, we can at least postulate a hybrid theory. Because hybrids between phenol and heterogeneous species contain those isomers. And this is the same in the Queensland sundews, of which one single uh, group of hybrids is not. Actually, Camille was successful in obtaining several slightly morphologically different hybrids, always from the same combination of species, but it's different individuals. Uh, so, uh, so far also, um, these hybrids have not officially been described and named. Um, one of these reasons is that the whole complex of hybrids is a bit heterogeneous and it's not um, well sorted out yet um, how to uh, distinguish them, but possibly it will result in a group of um, hybrids of same parentage but different morphology. So possibly several separate cultivars will be described in the future, but it's not finished yet. This story. However, the closely related, or the apparently closely related, Drosera adelie and Drosera scansandra that share several morphological features, are apparently incompatible even with each other. This has not been possible to create a hybrid between these two, possibly due to the different chromosome count, but possibly also uh, for other reasons. So this is almost the end of my talk. I see several of you are still alive, which is good. <laughs> uh, first of all, Siegfried and Irgard Hartmeier, who initially wanted to uh, attend uh, this meeting, but for health issues in uh, Ziggy's family, he himself is fine, but his mother is rather elderly and ill. Um, could not come, so he wants to um, greet all of you and uh, wanted me to convey um, his greetings. Um, and perhaps uh, we'll have the opportunity to have him and his wife with us in another meeting. Um, Kamil Pasek for very helpful discussions also about the history of the hybridization and details um, on the different uh, results he obtained. Uh, and of course, for uh, his unique entrepreneurship to try uh, hybridizing these species, uh, which is not uh, very easy for several reasons. Um, and of course, for being successful in, in crossing these two odd species with each other. And to Greg Burke, who accompanied us on an expedition to see Drosola Spesandro in, in the wild, which was a very particular experience in the field. And last but not least, I want, of course, to thank you for your kind attention in this uh, not very easy uh, time of the day between lunch and coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. It was very interesting. And if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Yes? And is it known about the crucial number of this hybrid? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Well. I would guess it is 30, but it could, of course, be 60 years old. I don't think it has been determined. Even between the European
European species or some part of the hybrid is not known. It is known, but it's not public. So I can't send you here. But you cannot seriously guess. Second <laughs> <laughs> question. So you, your conclusion is that King and Procera Villosa is a hybrid. Right. Their whole complex is um, tetraploid, so it is very likely that the ancestor of Rosaropilosa was already a hybrid. And perhaps the, um, but I don't know that if there are any diploids in the, in the complex in the Villosa group, it's actually a group of, of related species, um, but I guess all of them are tetraploids. So there must have been a hybridization event very early in the emergence of this whole clade of species. And interestingly, not all of the species contain both pinots. There are even some species that uh, apparently don't contain any. But absence of a chemical compound is always a very bad character for phylogenetic considerations. Absence could have too many reasons, because any bond mutation could cause it. Um, so it's far better if you have a presence, a positive signal for, for the presence of the compound. Um, and this indicates at least for Trosrobilosa that it's actually a hybrid origin. However, it may be very difficult to formulate the two parent species because uh, lots of additional back crossing events could have happened in between, so it cannot really 